Life Audio. Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Stay the Bible. I'm your host, Nicole Eunice, and I am super glad for the chance to be together today and this week. And this week, we're going to be looking at the word revive. So, looking at the word revive, so glad that you guys are finding encouragement here on this podcast. Every so often, I try to give a little bit of a shout out on places that people are listening from. So today, I want to give a shout out to Kenya, Ghana, Singapore, and Jamaica. So if you are listening from one of those four places, I just want you to know that I am thinking of you today. I'm praying for you and your community. How deeply I wish that we could sit down together and have a coffee or a tea and hear about what life is like where you live. But I also know that God is good. And he's active and he's moving and advancing his kingdom all around the world. And sometimes just hearing the names of places that people are tuning in from can remind all of us that that is true, that God is a God of the nations, a God of all tribes and all nations. So we are really glad to be together, and I love today's passage. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible, and we're going to play a little game today, and the game is That Reminds Me Of. That's another way we can practice learning how to see the Scripture as a whole from beginning to end, and we're going to do a little That Reminds Me Of as we think about this. And what I mean by that is, as you listen to this passage, I want you to think, what does this remind you of? Does it remind you of anything? And what what I mean by remind is, does it remind you of something about Jesus? Does it remind you about a different story? There are so many connections in Scripture. It is one of the most rich, beautiful things about Scripture is that these 66 books written over 1,600 different years by different authors, all equally inspired by the Holy Spirit, weaves together this beautiful connective thread and we get to be a part of it. Like when we go to the part of our Bible study where we ask the question, what does this mean for me? We are connecting in to the timeless truth of scripture in a way that applies in our everyday life, whether that everyday life is in Colorado or West Virginia or Singapore or Kenya or Jamaica, wherever you may find yourself today. When we get down to that, we are, we're always trying to extract from Scripture what is the principle here, what is the timeless truth, and then we ask the question, okay, how does that timeless truth apply to my life? So today we're going to be in the book of Ezekiel, which is like a little bit of a scary book that people try to avoid because there's a lot of violence and a lot of like prophecy and trying to understand a lot of it, and I get that, and we're not going to go deep into all of that today. But I want to make sure that we see this picture that God thought was so important for the prophet Ezekiel to understand that he put it into this vision where he was like experiencing this moment. And I want us to experience it as much as we can. So I'm going to read you Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, because this is kind of the vision that God gives for what revival can look like in our life. What, what does it mean that God revives us? And then we'll look at the picture that Ezekiel gets to experience in chapter 37. So chapter 36, a couple of verses that give us a vision for revival. And then chapter 37, we're going to talk about the story there. So take a listen here, take a deep breath. And I just invite you as you hear these words to picture what this looks like in your life. Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be cleaned. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Okay, so we get this picture in the midst of a lot of other contexts, but we get this picture in this first two verses and a promise that God is giving his people, that you can experience this promise where there will be this experience of revival of a, of a new way of life, a new heart, a new spirit. You'll have a spirit put in you that will, that will have you want to follow God, want to follow his laws. And all of that goes on in the midst of that. It says in 37, so this is what's going to happen next. And it says in verse one, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley 
it was full of bones. So now Ezekiel is going to enter into this vision. And all I want you to do right now, we're going to talk about what does it say? We're going to go through our Bible study in just a moment. But all I want you to do right now is picture this. Just picture this. He led me out. He set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. I love, I love that because it's like these bones aren't even close to a lot. <laughs> these bones are as dead as bones get. The bones were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. Okay, so imagine this. Are you with me? Are you picturing it as best as you can? pretty dramatic. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Now, I want you to picture and imagine that you are the prophet Ezekiel. You have just heard God say, I am the God who will take out your stone of flesh, your heart of flesh, your heart of stone, excuse me, I am the God who will take out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. I will put new life in you. I will breathe spirit into you. And then he goes out into this valley and has this experience of seeing what it looks like for revival to happen. Like it's just a very, very visceral picture. Okay, so let's pause there and we're going to ask the question. So what does it say? What does it say? What do you hear when you're hearing this story? I I know for me, there are a couple of things that stand off first is that it it's very, very clear, as I pointed out to you, that this is a very, very dead valley, like nothing live, nothing is alive. It's just completely dead, right? And then the second thing is that there's a process. There's a process that happens. And even when these skeletons, these dry bones are, are reassembled, and, and even when skin comes upon them, it's not until the breath of life is breathed into them that they truly come alive. So that's what we know it says here in this chapter. And now here's where we play the game. What does this remind you of? When you hear this idea of breath being breathed in, what does it remind you of? Here we go. First one, I'm going to answer for you. I'm going to give you a second. If you don't know what this might remind you of, and there might be other things that come to your mind, I'm going to give you two. I want you to flip in your Bible to John chapter 20. Okay, so all the way into the New Testament. So here we are, we're in the middle of the Old Testament. We're in the middle of Israel's like exile. We're in the middle of God saying, you've fallen away from me. I'm punishing you, but there will come a day where you'll be restored. All that's happening. And then we fast forward hundreds of years. And here is Jesus who is walking on the earth, right? And and here is Jesus who comes to say, the kingdom of God is near, and, and he quotes Isaiah. He quotes these prophets. And he says, I am the one who is to come. And he, he claims his place in the world as a Messiah. He does miracles. He can sustain people with food. He can bring people back to life. We see all of this happen. And then as it was prophesied, he suffers and is crucified. And then three days later, He's raised again to life and he appears to many people in his resurrected form. And so in John chapter 20, we're we're in this moment. We're post-resurrection, but pre-ascension. Ascension is when Jesus goes back to heaven. We're between in that in that in-between space. And in John chapter 20, here's what this passage says. On the evening of that first day of the week, so this is just a couple of days after the crucifixion, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Remember, Jesus was just killed by Jewish leaders. Like he was, it was just like a mob. Like 
sometimes I think we think about like, oh gosh, why did Jesus have to die on, on a cross? And and that's a another story for another day. But I think it's really important for us to remember that it was human beings, it was humans who said, This guy's gotta die. Like it was it was mankind, it was people like me and you who said he this this can't be, this can't go on, and took an innocent man and murdered him, right? And so that's all happened. And now, of course, the disciples are very scared about what's going to happen to their band of brothers that has been following Jesus around. And Jesus is now, you know, dead, although some of them have seen him resurrected. So they're very confused and very scared. So it says that the doors were locked and then Jesus came and stood among them. So I guess he just passes through locked doors. You know, this is one of those crazy things where you're like, what is the resurrected body like? He stands with them and he says, peace be with you. After he said that, he showed them his hands and sighed. So we know the marks of his suffering remained. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we're in the dry bones. We're in a place where God says to Ezekiel the prophet, prophesy to these bones so that the breath of life can come into them. Fast forward, we're with Jesus and he's with his disciples and he says, I am sending you out in the world. And before he does that, he breathes on them. And he breathes on them so that they might have the Spirit of God. Ezekiel 36, I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will breathe life into you. You will receive the Spirit. What does that remind you of? One more passage really quick. Genesis 2, verse 7. So we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. And if you go all the way back to the beginning, what happens at the beginning of the Bible? It says that God forms the man out of the dust of the earth and then he breathes life into him. So we've got Genesis, Ezekiel, John, and probably more places where we could go and we experience what revival looks like. It's this, it's this thing where there is a person, right? A person is there. There is a person there when the, when the bones come together and the tendons go on the flesh in Ezekiel, there's a person there when it says that God formed the man out of the dust of the earth. And there is a person there when the disciples are with Jesus, right? They, they've been with Jesus. But the difference happens, the revival happens when the life of God is breathed into them, when the Holy Spirit is breathed into them. This is what it means that we are revived by God, that we can be walking around sort of like the living dead here on earth until we experience Jesus. We say yes to Jesus and we receive the Holy Spirit, which is a revival life within us. And that revival life within us is not just for us, but as it says in John chapter 20, it's for others. It says, I am sending you out. You are being sent out to forgive, to be people of forgiveness. You are sent out to send out the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is a message of forgiveness. So when it says, if you forgive them, they'll be forgiven. If you you don't forgive them, they won't be forgiven. It's not that, that God's giving us the power of judgment. He's saying he's giving us the power of the gospel. And if we preach the gospel with our words and our lives, if we are preaching and living forgiveness, then people are experiencing forgiveness. And if we are not preaching and living forgiveness, then people are not experiencing forgiveness. Like the gift of Jesus is being held back from them if we are not out there doing that. And the only way that we can do that, the only way we can experience that is because the life of the holy the breath of the holy spirit has been put into us by god it is not something that we manufacture inside of us it's not something that we just drum up i think the idea is like we can't if you think of it like a fire like we can't start a fire without any fuel like you can you can know what a fire is you can see a fire you can know even what a fire feels like when you're near it but if you have no fuel you cannot start a fire and, and, and like this, we can know what it means to experience the gospel. We can see what it looks like when people are really living into who Jesus has made them to be. But it, you can't find it within you. Like 
The only way you're going to experience that revival is by the breath of God being in you. And by being a person who recognizes that God's not calling you to the story in Ezekiel to think about being Ezekiel, he's calling you to the story to think about being that dry bone, that we are dry bones and that there are times in our life where we just have places in our life that feel so dead. You might not all feel all dead all over, but you just, you have places that feel dead. And, and our God is a God of revival and resurrection beginning to end. Genesis, prophets, the gospel, all of it talks about this idea of revival. It is ours to have. It is not something that is reserved for certain people. It is not something that's reserved for you to get your life together before you experience it. It is merely the way we surrender to God and say, God, I ask you to come into my life, to breathe life into me, to sustain me like we talked about last week. That is what God offers. So when we ask the question, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means this is who our God is. Like for me at the very base level, no matter where you are, whatever country you're in right now, whatever community you live in, whatever hardship you're experiencing, God is a God of revival, which means he's constantly breathing life into you, which reminds me of one more passage that says, outwardly, we are wasting away day by day, but inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Like outwardly, we are wasting away. Like that's just a reality. The reality is things are hard. Things are broken. Things are dying. We are dying, right? Like physically, we are all terminal. We are all, there's already an end date for all of us here on this earth. That is not not true for anyone. That's true for 100% of us, no matter where you are, right? However, the promise of God says you can be renewed day by day in the midst of whatever's happening in your life. Inwardly, you are renewed day by day. That is what happens when we trust in God, when we rely on God, when we surrender our lives to God. We are people who experience him answering our prayers. He will answer our prayer of revival to bring life into us, to sustain us for wherever he calls us, to endure whatever suffering we find ourselves in, to to be able to be courageous and bold with our love in whatever problems God has given us to solve, whatever he's asked us to be a part of what he's doing. All of that is ours in him. That is what revival looks like. It is not reserved for a certain moment on a youth retreat or a certain kind of person or for spiritual people who take mission trips. It's not reserved for any of us. It's not something that you find in a church building. It's not something that you find because a certain speaker comes. It's not like that. It's God alone who can revive. It is God alone who can breathe life into you. Does he use those things in our lives? Of course he does. But he's not re- he's not confined by those things ever. So if you can be within voice, if you're within listening of this podcast, you are a person that God can reach. You are a person that God can breathe life into. And we pray together and we say, God, breathe life into this place in my life. God, breathe life into me. We just surrender to the reality that God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He is the one who breathes spirit into us and he will do it. All right, everyone. Talk to you next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.